anyone can grab a trading signal and run a back test. But does what, what does that really teach you though? You know, because you look, yeah, okay, you can see how something performed over a period in history, but the future might not be the same as that that period that you've studied, right? Mm. So, so if you if that's your only, if that you know, if you think that's research, and you and you think you've learned something, that you've learned nothing. Welcome to the Algorithmic Advantage. We're here to expand the toolkit of the quant trading community and introduce investors to the many advantages of systematic trading. Our goal is to educate and inspire as we embark on a captivating journey into the vast knowledge and experience of leading portfolio managers and other experts in the field. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please subscribe, leave us a review, or even buy us a coffee via the link on the algorithmicadvantage.com. We really appreciate it. Welcome back to the Algorithmic Advantage podcast, everyone. We're super excited to have you here with us. And a reminder that if you're um, uh, not signed up on the website, that it's worth getting onto the website and signing up to our newsletter just so that you can be in the know when new shows are being released and so on. If you're an audio listener, it's worth uh, checking out the YouTube channel for the visuals uh, as well from time to time. some For some shows, that's more important than others. Uh, today, I'm really excited to be chatting with uh, the founders and partners of Horizon 3 Investment Management, Paul Netherwood and Sanjeev Luckenpal. Um, we're looking forward to a very fascinating conversation, uh, given their rich uh, history and, and experience in quantitative trading um and uh and they have a a, a long track record that, that demonstrates just how long they've been in the game so welcome uh paul and sanj hello yeah, great, great to be here to thank be you here. for inviting so, us love to, lovely to see rich as well g'day rich <laughs> i must admit i'm a big fan of sanj have been for a very long time and uh, I've been following him on LinkedIn for a long time, and I advise everyone to to do so because he gives these pearls of wisdom um, from time to time. And I'm I'm loving his um, his global macro viewpoint on the way this economy is turning into oblivion. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, yeah. You'll you'll find some pearls of wisdom if you dig if you dig dig through all the dross, you know. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Nice. Too humble. Well, um, Sanj, do you want to start by giving us a background, like give us a, a high-level bio of uh, how you got into trading and into the markets and, and what led you to, to where you are today? Sure, yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, I was a physicist at university for my degree and, um, you know, as, as, as you – uh, there have been various climate changes, you know, uh, but it always seems to be that whenever students graduate, they, they're always told, oh, it's a really bad time, it's hard to get jobs, and, you know, mm-hmm. it's not that, you know, it's not that easy. And uh, so I was told the same thing when my degree finished. So I thought, oh, you know, what do I really want to do? And I thought, well, I don't want to be a math teacher. I don't want to be a physics teacher. I don't work in the lab, right? I love physics, but I wasn't, wasn't really into it. So... I grew up watching Capital City in the 80s. I saw all these people wafting about in banks and suits and trading bonds and things. And, you know, and I remembered all of that thinking, oh, yeah, I'd really like to be in that scene. How do I do that? I don't know anything about it. So I went off and did an MSc in finance, right? And Mm -hmm. there we were doing, you know, corporate finance and modules and international finance and econometrics and things like that. So that, 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 you know, that, that sat very well with me, you know, from a mathematical standpoint at the time, because back in those days, I was pretty good at math. And uh, and and so I kind of always thought after having done that, I'd go into more of a research type role, you know, I'd be more of a quantitative research, that something like that in finance or whatever. And um, I accidentally fell into what ended up being one of the greatest hedge funds in the world. And, and I didn't even know it, right? You know, so I'd, I'd like, you know, just applied for as many jobs as I could. I, you know, I used to send my MSc dissertation 
uh, which was uh, an econometric model and based on co-integration and error correction between spot and forward prices. And, and, and it got picked up by this firm, this little firm called AHL, right, which uh-huh. was very small back in those days. It occupied one office on the fifth floor of the entire uh, EDNF man uh, FCM uh, kind of brokerage, you know, house or whatever. And I got, you know, I got an interview to which I did really badly, but they gave, I got a job, I got given a job anyway. And next thing you know, I'm doing like IT work. I was like, I was doing sort of writing data shredders and things like that, which was supporting the research effort uh, for the research teams at AHL. And I was just, you know, handling time series data and using an in-house 4GL, which was actually written by by Mr. Netherwood here, who who was who was also uh, very senior there at the time in the software development and research department, and um, and uh, you know what? I didn't even know where I was. I was so clueless, mm-hmm. right? I've done an MSc in finance. I could barely read the financial pages and understand what the hell was going on in the world. I had no clue after having done, you know, all this MSc in finance and everything. Even is it is, is I, I distinctly remember this guy called Felix, who was one of the IT support guys who did the hardware and stuff like that, and having a cigarette with him on the roof of the building one day, and he and he and he gave me this lecture. He goes, "Do you know where you are? You know, th- there I am. You know, this young whippersnapper, twenty twenty one. He goes, "Do you know where you are? This is this is a hundred and fifty year old commodity futures brokerage has been around for 150 years they own plantations they're in sugar they're in nuts and molasses they you know, do you know what i mean i had no i had no concept of that and then and then suddenly we started to realize that the rest of the man group wasn't us ahl was like treated like some kind of rocket scientist secretive sort of group that had not you know that was completely distinctly separate from what was going on in the rest of the man group and, and and everything else and then to cut a long story short right i kind of got frustrated with writing data shredders and this that and the other and i one day walked into the thought i want to get closer to the markets right so i walked into the head of department where they ran the systems they actually ran the models and stuff like that and said hey can I have a job and she said actually i'd love to give you a job and by the way here's a secret where we're sacking all of our traders in New York and Switzerland and we're bringing trading to London because it's too separated from the systems guys. Right. right. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to create a brand new trading team from scratch. We don't want anyone with any previous prior knowledge because we want people to do things our way. And that's it. Next thing you know, I fell into it. I fell into a trading job by complete accident. Right. And it was always, always, view trading or broking and whatever because I, I was more into the research side of things i always viewed it as like a lower a lower sort of tier sort of hmm. academically right hmm. type of job right and um but Cowboys. once i one, yeah once i got into it though i loved it and i quickly rose to head of the trading desk and you know i ran a you know we had a very young team average age was like 20 i was like old because i was by that stage 23 24 right and um and 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 from there it just grew and grew the you know ahl's returns were fantastic the the clients were flooding in they were doing fund launches all over the world even in australia and things like that big launches with ord minette jardine flemings and things like Mm -hmm. that and uh they were just raising loads and loads of money and the, the 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 trading operation just grew with AHL's funds, but the thing is as well though, back in those days, the Man Group hadn't just seeded or sort of taken a stake in AHL. They had other um, CTAs like you know one of the pioneers of futures business in um, in London um, in those days back in you know the the nineties was uh, the Mint Fund. Right, a lot of those guys, I guess, moved to ISAM um, eventually or whatever. Mm-hmm. Now, Mint Fund was a billion dollars when AHL was a hundred million, right? Mm. Then, that, then they, they, you know, they stayed at a billion, and AHL then took over a billion and then carried on growing. Now, eventually, all of that business came through my trading desk. So we had mm. we had Height Height Co, we had the Mint Fund, and we had AHL's business all flowing through our twenty four hour operations. So we had a team of young guys running you know 
eight billion dollars leveraged up flooding you know we we had we had three brokers in every futures pit we were on two yeah. phones all day long you know swearing down telephones trading or whatever you know i had, I had brokers flying in from all over the world you know ready to take us out at a moment's notice because they were so keen on keeping our business so you know when you're 24 that's quite addictive mm. yeah <laughs> do you know, do you know what I mean? so that's that's yeah. basic that's well, basically how I how I fell into it and um you know I could go on from there about how I ended up leaving and working for David Beach and then you know uh but I'll I'll Well Sam, I'll this brings it, you to I'll, meeting I'll to there. knowing Paul this brings you sort of to knowing Paul and AHL yeah, so, so Paul and Paul and I worked together uh when I was um doing more of the IT type work I once need I I needed like I mean it was a young company uh, we we all we you know every every night we're all in the pub you know and things like that. it was a fun place to work we had water fights in the office and they took us for weekends away it was just when i it told my great, friends yeah. at home what those we were, were doing, the good old days it was, oh yeah, my god yeah. it was it was it was such a great time i can't tell you how good it was working for ahl uh, ahl back in those days but you know so me and paul were friendly anyway you know from you know the pub and things like that but one time we needed to work together and I needed, I, I, I thought of this idea of, of something that I could do in terms of linking graphics to the software code and stuff. And Paul wrote this function for me and uh, he wrote this function for me that allowed me to do this thing that no one had ever done before. And uh, everyone was so impressed with that. And that actually, it, the reason I'm telling you that is, is that when I walked into the head, you know, the head of the systems group, this uh, this this lady called Miranda Davy, who was a brilliant manager, um, she 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 um, you know she was she'd heard about what had happened you know from the managers meeting in terms of my latest project and whatever. So she was kind of like quite keen to have me on board, and it's all because Paul helped me with this function. <laughs> Wow. Do you see yeah. what I mean? Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 later late later when um. I mean, there was another guy, actually, I have to mention, who's pivotal, a guy called Andrew Barton. When I first started, I was clueless, man. I, 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 I wasn't a trained programmer or whatever, you know. Uh, I could never get Fortran to compile when I was at university and things. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 but this one guy, you know, you're supposed to, you know, you know, you imagine the city being this cutthroat place, everyone at their backs and blah, blah. This one guy, my manager at the time, Andrew Barton, one night he sat me down and he goes, right, Sand, we're not leaving the office until you get this. I just couldn't, it just wasn't clicking with me how this language worked. And, and he sat there, put his arm around me and he goes, right, come on in, let's do it. And we sat there and sat there and he explained it and explained it. And we did it and we blah, blah, blah. And suddenly it clicked. And from then on, I could start writing the software. So I have to mention that guy because, you know, without him, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here today. You know what I mean? And then yeah. It was only later on down the line when I was started working at Beach Capital and trading for David Beach, it's that's when I recontacted Paul, being the best programmer that I knew, uh, and, 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 and sort of said, hey, I've got an opportunity to launch something here, a systematic fund, blah, blah, blah. Do you want to come work with me? And then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll cut it off there because um, I don't want to talk about myself all day. And uh, well, I'll let Paul, I'll let Paul I'll... Give, give his background. Yeah, I'll ask Paul, but I can't resist asking while we're on it in case I forget. But, Sanj, you know, being of that era where you've been through um, having traders on the pit, going through that whole pit experience um, well before, you know, the the, uh, the the screen trading and electronic trading coming on and also sitting on a, on a, on a sell side desk by the sounds of it and, and dealing with the flow of all of those um, big funds coming through, um, compared to some of the, the newer traders starting off today and people getting into quantitative trading and so on and have none of that background, the, the, the question, of course, is, is did that help? How much has that helped now? Like, it's, it, is it really quite different or there's a lot of threads that you still pull on that come through and, and help you in, in systematic trading today? You, you kind of, you, you're, you're battle hardened, right? In mm. the sense that when, you, when you, whether you're a trader or an investment manager like me and Paul, and you've got a real track record where you've been doing this stuff for years, you become battle-hardened from a strategic perspective and a trading perspective. 
you know, from a strategic quantitative, because, you know, you've deployed models, you've seen them, whether they work or not, you've tried concepts, you've tested ideas, you've researched them. So you become battle hardened with real, real experience. And, mm. and I think, I think that helps you think a little bit outside of the box. I'll, get, I'll, give, you, I'll give you an example. One night I was sitting on the trading desk in the middle of the night doing the, the night shift on my own trading Asia. And I got a call by Martin Lewick. And this is when the whole Nick Leeson thing kicked off, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Martin, Martin Lewick phoned me up and he goes, Sanj, uh, what's going on over with this thing? So I sort of told him and he goes, right. He goes, um, should we be cutting our positions on Symex then? Because, you know, that this this problem is so bad that the exchange itself might be at risk. And it, and see, I was I was young. I wasn't, you know, I've been trading for a couple of years. Martin Luke been doing this longer than I had, you know. Mm. And so, so this real world experience caused Martin Luke to phone me up and sort of say, hey, the exchange might be in trouble. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Mm. This wasn't even that wasn't even on my radar. So having real experience of real trading, you know, Pit trading is irrelevant these days now because electronics so easy. You know, you know, it's, there is no pit element to it. There's no, oh, we've got to worry about the structure of our, you know, pit and the positioning of our broker. Has he got good line of sight access? Blah blah blah. You don't have to worry about all that physicality anymore with electronic trading. So it's so much easier. But the 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 you can just focus on the prices and the execution and the ebb and flow and the strength and weakness of the market when you're trying to execute orders efficiently and get size in and out. My, my experience there was we did so much size. I gained so much experience of throwing massive size into markets like live cattle, you know, and and, battle hardened. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Right. And things like that. You know, I, I, you know, rolling, rolling, you know, trading London coffee back in the day, you know, you try to do 100 lots, you'd move it $100 while while your broker was winking to his mate in the options pitch going, oh, it's them mm-hmm. again. Do you, do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Kind of thing. So, so you don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff anymore. So it's not as relevant, that type of experience and the, the sort of physical, phys- physicality of it all and mm-hmm. what your brokers might or might not do to you. Do you, know, yeah. do you know what I mean? And, and so... And so now it's time. It's Paul's time to shine because uh, it's really the um, the age old battle between the the guys in the in the back office uh, programming and developing, and the traders in the front office. And and now, of course, the uh, no one wants to hire a trader unless they can code. So, um, Paul, tell us about your background. Give us a, a high level of um, you know your studies as well and your experience to date. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, just sort of sort of tailing into Sanjay's last <clears throat> comment there is actually when you look at it from the other way around mm. when you were quant that you're dealing with so much data you tend to think of things uh, uh, from a statistical perspective yeah because you can't you can't look at the data as, as a continuous stream you look at it yeah uh, in uh, in various uh, different forms you transform it you, you you visualize it you you graph it so you tend to see things often as a whole and you, it's very easy to miss certain nuances of the data, uh, which are quite important. But you get those nuances if you're sitting with it every day, like a trader. Yeah, I mean, traders can also mm. have the opposite, where they're perhaps missing the whole picture. Yeah, but um, this is one of the mm. things that we've discovered, which we'll get into later on, is actually those uh, important aspects of how the market operates and the way it interfaces with the the economies of, of uh, not only of individual markets, but the uh, countries as well, is a critical element. And it's so easy to miss that from a comp perspective. So uh, I think it's, it's it's having the combination of the two perspectives. Yeah, the two sides mm. of the same coin is a really interesting focus. And that's something that myself and Sandra, you know, felt that we were, uh, you know, our, our opposite backgrounds have actually um, given us quite a, um, you know, a, a, a good view of how the markets work now, I think. Yeah. So my background is I, I'm mm. a full yeah. on computer geek. Uh, so um, I did a degree in computer science. I did a, a PhD in computer science uh, in AI and uh, machine vision. I went on to work at um, the uh, human genome project, building vision systems, for their research to pick bacterial colonies out of egg, dishes of agar jelly 
Um, I also work for uh, mm -hmm. British Army, writing fire control systems for Challenger tanks. Um, I think some of that software might be in the Ukraine at the moment. I don't know. Uh, that's outside my <laughs> secrecy there. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, we so spoke to um, Mark uh, Malik. Oh yeah, yeah. A little while ago, about his um, his having to write a paper for positioning tanks, a, a mathematical <laughs> model for positioning tanks on the battlefield. Yeah, well, we, I, I was working on that sort of stuff uh, back in the eighties. So uh, that was like, it's, it's in many ways, the uh, battlefield technology has evolved a lot, but some of the ideas were were thought of quite a long time ago. So uh, very interesting, but also that kind of mathematical um, uh, software development part has always been kind of part of the, the DNA of what I've done, which is why I um, got a job at AHL. Uh, which is, again, I had no idea what kind of firm it was and what its importance was uh, to, uh, you know, the, the hedge fund world and the city. Uh, and um, uh, I just thought it was a cool coding experience. And um, in many ways, mm -hmm. in, in the U when you're in the UK, yeah, is, if you're in the US, if you, if you come out of um, universities, uh, you want to go and work for one of the, the big tech firms. Yeah. And it was true back then as well. But in the UK, there aren't really any big tech firms, not... There are some, but they're not really quite like they are in the US. So actually, the places with the money and the real interesting research projects and the ones that are doing cutting edge work is actually in the city, in finance. Yeah. Yeah. The big investment banks mm -hmm. and yeah. the hedge funds. Yeah. And I think it's actually still true today as well, actually, that, you know, if you want to get a real cutting edge job, yeah, yeah you either kind of go in, in, into a hedge fund or, or into an investment bank or, or uh, if you want to start a startup, you go into the fintech world, which is essentially the same sort of thing. So um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of um, you know, a lot of uh, cool stuff being done in, in those kind of organisations. So uh, that's very much where you, where you'd go if you're graduating from a, a STEM subject in the UK. Um, so um, yeah, so as Sandra said, I, I was building research models for for uh, AHL, uh, building new trading models. Um, uh, I rebuilt their trading system while I was there, and um, um, and uh, it was a very cool place to work. Lots of real cutting edge stuff, and um, but uh, actually, with, you know, things th times change. I got a uh, an offer to go and work uh, for a um, a startup in um, building risk systems for investment banks. So I took that. I went off to work for Nomura for a bit, and that was interesting to work on the um uh, on the the in the inside of a very big project at the time it was one of the the biggest projects in in the city when i was working on that it was like like over 200 c plus plus programmers building that system um but uh mm -hmm. it was kind of it was it was all great stuff but i always longed to be able to do something yeah on my own yeah uh you know be part of yeah a small startup business again in fact in many ways try and recreate the old early AHL atmosphere, which was great. When you work for a small company, you're kind of doing so many, you do little bits of everything and you, you, you've got access to it. Mm. You know, you know what the business is trying to do. Yeah. You could, cause you can see it, it's right there. Yeah. So you're very much aligned mm. with the goals yeah. of the business. So it feels, you get this great feeling of sort of like belonging. So, um, so when Sand approached me and saying, Hey, let's, value. let's, yeah, yeah, so I mean, Sam so said, let's do the same thing again. Grow underneath you, you know. Yes, yes. So, um, so getting the opportunity to do that again, yeah, uh, and I, but build it ourselves was when myself and Sam um, set up Horizon, um, and uh, uh, and that what was, year what was, was that? that? I think when we set it up, when we met to set it up was two thousand three, <sighs> wasn't it, Sam? So that was twenty twenty years ago. Yeah. No, no, it was um, it was um, two thousand and one. Really? That's Wasn't right. It? Actually, it? no, yeah, yeah, because it was it, yeah. Paul. Paul joined. Paul joined the week of nine eleven. That's right. Wow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember that? Memorable. That's right. Yes. And then, and yeah. then we spent the next couple of years developing and writing software and doing research and you know building the models and stuff. Yeah. Was yeah. was Beach Horizon operating at that point in time, or were you sort of in the no? So Beach Horizon phase? was formed as a company. Beach Horizon. So we were we were inside Beach Capital at the time, right? Which was run by David Beach, and obviously very famous in its own right because David was so good, right? Uh, 
And so Beach Horizon event after we got the models and we did some testing, you know, take, you know, this is this is part of, part of it. It's a, it's a it takes a while to get your investment management license, right? Mm, and we yeah. and we and and this was being launched as a separate entity from Beach Capital. So it had to have its own investment management license and things like that. So that gave us time to do more work and build more infrastructure ready for ready for launch and stuff. So the actual company, I think, was incorporated in 2004, uh, if I remember rightly, as Beach Horizon. And we actually launched the fund on Paul's birthday, which was the 2nd of May 2005. Okay. <laughs> nice. So, so every year ask how... on Paul's birthday is also the birthday of our fund. Nice. There you go. How did you guys um, fund the startup then? So was was David Beach involved and in, and or were you guys putting all your own money in? Presumably, there it sounds like there was quite an investment in time and, and and infrastructure to get the whole thing moving. Yeah, well, it was all it was all David basically. You know, the the you know Beach Beach Capital at the time was, you know, in one of the one of the kind of top I think ten or twenty CTAs in Europe. At, at, at a, just over a billion dollars kind of thing. And David had kind of soft closed it and clients were gagging to give him money because his track record was so good and so different as well, you know, from mm. a lot of other CTAs. Uh, and so David kind of, David kind of got money into Beach Horizon because he sort of went to all these clients like, you know, the Lixors and the Adias and the whoever's of this world that, that all loved him uh, and, and sort of said, Hey, I'll let you give me a little bit more money, but you got to stick some into this kind of thing. Okay. So, so before you knew it, you know, we were we were pushing. I don't know, fifty, a hundred. I can't even remember, Paul. Um, and and but yeah. but the problem was, right? Our clients that that were giving us this money were all clients of a larger firm. So on the back of the fact that. David met their hurdles size wise, track length wise. We were a sub three year manager with less than a hundred million that they would these large firms would never have allocated to otherwise. Yes. You see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Kind of In the right Sorry, place at the right time, Sanj. But at, Well, <coughs> yeah, yeah, you know, so that got us off the that got us off yeah. the ground. Yeah, a lot of luck, yeah. a lot of serendipity in this business. You know, you sometimes right place, right time, knowing the right mm. people. It's it's a shame that it's, it is like that, but that is kind of the reality of a lot of businesses. Mm. Or just just I mean, Sand recounting the tale of how you guys got together as sort of like these instances in time where these random events materialized yeah. to these these tail events, you know, Paul, where Paul, big Paul, things Paul, happen. Paul, yeah, Paul yeah. set up his, you know, it was a lot going on that week, obviously with nine eleven. Paul set up his computer, and I remember me and him sat down on a, on a table, and we literally started with a blank sheet of A four paper, didn't we, Paul? Yeah. Hmm. The yeah. whole and then yeah. and then Paul sat there and gave me a speech about object orientation. And the <laughs> next thing you know, the next thing you know, we were building <laughs> models, weren't we? Kind yeah. of thing. So so let's jump into that. Um just to get into some of the practical side of it. What what was your philosophy and what were some of the models that you were building and working on back then? What was the focus? And then, you know, we can we can gravitate into what you're doing now and how that's changed over time, I suppose, and you can start to tell us about your philosophy and approach today. But I'm interested in some of that journey as well and how it started out. It's, yes, I mean, some of the... Either of you. Yeah, really? some of the core models, yeah, that we built back then are still in play uh, today with, uh, like, uh, evolutions and enhancements. Yeah, so this is one of the things about doing research is you, sometimes you have models which are uh, very robust and very consistent and you evolve them uh, over time through further research. So one of the interesting things about doing uh, research and developing models is you often find yourself with uh, core models that are very consistent and work very, very well over a long period of time. Other models you find that are, are or may prove themselves in research, but we might decide that actually they're not necessarily appropriate for the current market environment we're in, and we take them out. Um, so, um, uh, so one of the uh, the things about doing research is actually having a, a, an approach where you can 
validate those models, understand them and try and make them robust. Uh, we look at building uh, models which have uh, parameter sets which which are stable over over um, multiple uh, time horizons and multiple parameter sets. It's very tempting when you're building um, uh, back testing models to sort of say, okay, which parameter works the best? Yeah, given this set of possible uh, options in a, in a model, let's pick the be very best option. Um, so you might have like a, a chart of performance which does this sort of thing. And the temp temptation is to pick the top. Yeah. What we like to do is have a models which have a very stable parameter set so that you have like a, almost like a plateau of, of performance. So uh, it might tail off at either end so that when you're picking something in the middle of a plateau of performance, yeah, those tend to be a lot more stable um, yeah. uh, over time. So it's it's about having uh, you know not only robustness of research methodology but also you know robustness in terms of your uh, the way you select models and um, and decide whether they're effective for your for your program or not. Um, so our core models are based on something called digital signal processing, uh, which is an engineering discipline for the analysis of signals. Um, so it's used a lot in. Um, uh, and audio, um, uh, mobile phones, uh, the very fact that we can have fairly uh, good international uh, um, uh, calls in presence of, uh, of noisy signals is down to DSP. So uh, it's, it's going, going on. Well, in this, this is very, very right interesting and, and makes you unique. But can you explain DSP for our listeners? So um, it sort of introduces them to the idea how you use your Fourier analysis or whatever to identify your component signals, et cetera. Can you just go through that process? Because it's fascinating. Yeah, so um, so if you if you treat like a price series as literally just a, a sequence of um, of positive and negative values, you essentially have a, um, so that they're, they're, you start off with say returns, yeah, and those are, every market's got a, a series of positive and negative returns. Um, you can put those through a number of DSP technologies. So one of them is, um, Filtering. So filtering allows you to extract yeah, slow moving frequencies, high moving frequencies, um, and uh, and uh, um, for example, like to extract particular parts of that of that signal. So from a um, from a market price perspective, we'd be looking for to identify periods which are like long term trending, short term trending. Yeah. Um, and uh, whether we're, we're looking for rising or falling markets over different time horizons. So frequencies map onto time horizons. Yeah. Um, and then but the I interesting see. thing about DSP technology is you can, you can take multiple frequencies. And you can actually transform the price data into a, um, into a different form. Yeah. Uh, one of the methods is called Fourier, where the actual, you actually take, take it from the time domain and putting it in the frequency domain. And in the frequency domain, you can see all of the frequencies that are present within a, within a signal. Um, it's the same data. So you're but it's decomposing just... it across different frequencies, et cetera. It's a decomposition. And, and so you can then isolate things that you want to target for your signal. Exa is that how you exactly, doing it? exactly. And then, but one of the interesting things about it is actually you can, you can use it to, to help um, design the, the systems that you're using to extract those frequencies. So it's like it's a whole theoretical framework for you to build these kind of models, um, which we've applied, found a way of applying it to uh, time series. Could you do a basic form of DSP with a, a sort of a standard back testing engine, Paul, or is this something that you, you've really got to build out in-house? You know, one, one of the key things for us about the DSP, right, is that, you know, anyone can grab a trading signal and run a back test. But does, what, what does that really teach you, though? You know, because you look, yeah, OK, you can see how something performed over a period in history. But the future might not be the same as that that period that you've studied, right? Mm. So, so if you if that's your only, if that you know, if you think that's research, and you and you think you've learned something, that you've learned nothing. Mm. That model will fail. That model will fail in a changing world environment. Do you know what I mean? What the DSP technology allows you to do is to actually have a theoretical framework and underpinning and understanding, right? 
at different levels of depth about why you're doing what you're doing, why you shouldn't be doing certain other things. The DSP analysis shows you things that are problematic with certain types of filters and why you shouldn't be using those and, and this and that. And so you're, so, so you're then forming a thesis, gaining understanding about the technology or the maths that you're employing, right? Mm. That's not just reliant on whether or not, right? It looked like it performed well over the last five years. Mm. You, you actually have yeah. a theoretical uh, basis for really yeah. identifying and understanding why you're applying something and what you're doing. That's that's the whole core of our philosophy when it comes to research. If you haven't learned anything proper from in, from a scientific perspective, right? Then 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 what do you really know? Running back tests isn't research, right? Yeah. Mm. Where could uh, somebody go to pick up, say, their first book on DSP or learn something about it? Any ideas? Uh, well, I wrote quite a nice little intro to it on my um, uh, on the Horizon website, actually. So you can actually okay. go there to get a feel, yeah, Very to good. get a feeling for what it's all about, um, and then from there you can you know follow some of the references. Yeah, but um, awesome. But uh, the, one of the problems with the DSP world is quite vast. Yeah, the the technology is um, yeah, very mature, and there's lots of um, uh, uh, there's a huge richness in terms of methodology and techniques. So uh, what we have found is like a, a route through the that that vast uh, landscape of information to the key things that work for us. Um, so we've tried to highlight some of those. So if our, you're a sound website. engineer, Paul, this is um, this would be right in the sound engineer's domain, would it? DSP? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I did a talk once actually where I was um, um, I, I converted a price series, yeah, uh, to a sound so that people could hear what the price series sounded like. Yeah, uh, yeah so, and actually, well, I heard that. If yeah, people and want actually, to hear corn, is, they come to your website and they can hear corn. <laughs> That's right, yeah, and the key, and it sounded really, really noisy. It didn't really sound like anything, yeah. And that's actually really interesting because yeah, actually yeah. a lot of market behaviour is noise, yeah. So, um, mm. so it actually it's kind of like an interesting take out from that. And actually, the the the, uh, the one of the difficulties you have with trading is filtering out the signal from the noise and um, and trying to identify what is relevant, yeah. And you can't always do it, yeah. Uh, uh, with purely automated techniques which is why you know we've we've evolved some of our ideas um but one of the interesting things about the dsp techniques it does tell you yeah what what you can't do um so when you're looking at different frequencies um some like long-term frequencies you need to be looking at it for the very long term to know whether you're in it or not yeah so i, I use like an, an analogy for music so say for example you were you were musically inclined yeah and um you were, you were asked to guess what a note was being played so if i played a note on an electronic keyboard and that note was held for a while you could probably have a good chance of guessing what that note was if you're musically inclined yeah but the problem is if you said to say when when was that note played? Well, it was played over a long period of time. There was no one single point in time which it was played. But if we were to reduce the duration of the note so we could identify exactly what point in time it was played, yeah, to the millisecond, you wouldn't be able to hear the note. It'd be like a click because it'd be so fast. It's like a click, mm. yeah. That, um, so that's basically the, so that, so you can identify exactly in time when that, when that frequency occurred. Yeah. But you can't identify what the frequency is. And this is because, the, uh, it suffers from what's known as the uncertainty principle. Yeah. Which is exactly the same as yeah. in physics for location of and speed of an electron is the same as you can't identify the time. Yeah. And the frequency with equal precision. And that's one of the things you realize, hmm. yeah, that in, in, in when you hit the theoretical world, yeah, that there are limitations. And we realize where the limitations exist, which is why we introduced our pattern recognition technique, yeah, which is to allowing for those discontinuities in price series, yeah, and the difficulties of, of analyzing uh, and timing every frequency that are available in the, in the in the time series. So we we complemented the DSB techniques with a pattern recognition technique, yeah, which was using a completely different methodology, yeah, which allowed for the, for nice the things ball. that the DSP couldn't capture. Hmm. 
This is giving you deep insights into the nature of price from what you're doing there. I'm loving what you're talking about here. It's, um... So it's, it's kind of like after I record this podcast and I hit remove background noise, I want the application that can do that for the markets then and uh, remove the background noise. Thanks. Here's the actual uh, DSP. signal yeah. uh, amidst yeah. the noise. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, let's trade that. So we're not looking at yes. discrete things here. We're looking at waveforms which aren't localized. Therefore, you do get this uncertainty um, principle arising from um, your analysis of it. So that's fascinating. And really, I, I can see that working into the uncertainty that resides in the market itself. Is there is there parallels here? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, what the way that that manifests itself, right, is that is that, you know, when you're filtering using DSP, essentially, you know, that's very linear. The, the relationship with the data is very, very, very linear. But as we know, markets and prices exhibit linear and nonlinear behavior, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so when everything's trending up nice and smoothly, you know, you're taking the escalator up. But then then you can suddenly take the elevator down, right? And, mm. and, and so so at that point, the systems that are linear, uh, you know, man the, the pro some of the problems that manifest themselves are uh, end up being lag, right? Lag of response because you're not identifying the exact timing of the change of the frequency or whatever. And this is where the pattern recognition comes in because that in itself is very nonlinear, right? You know, we can we we can identify patterns that are very small, just a few weeks maybe. Right, or we can identify patterns that are very large. They could be like you know, uh, have formed over a, a, a the course of a year. So, but but they the, they they may signal the same direction in market. Say say you know a, a, a reversal to the downside. Say for example, in in a particular market. But both patterns are relevant, right? The 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 that linear relation. You don't you know just because you've only got a pattern of a few weeks doesn't mean the trend's not about to change or just because you've got a pattern of a whole year so that 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 relationship between the pattern itself and what the the, the features that you're picking up in the data through the pattern in in terms of relevance to the periodicity of the trend say right and what whether it's a short term medium term or long term trend that becomes broken down kind of thing and um the way that we interplay the two sides, the linear and the nonlinear, is is very interesting. But what what you know, and I'll, I'll let Paul speak to to that a lot more. But but what I would say to you is is that you know we've researched things over years and years and years, and you know you try to you know employ different techniques to deal with problems that you might see with DSP systems or whatever, right? And and sometimes like the solution is or a proposed solution is, hey, we're not reactive enough. Let's have some more faster models, right? Um, but but what we found when we were doing that is that yeah, you get maybe a marginal timing response, but because it's part of a whole package of different frequencies, you're only getting a marginal gain. And and in fact, when those faster models are irrelevant, they actually costing you money because they're hemorrhaging money in, in other periods where you're not making that specific contextual gain when the when when the trend changes and so 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 you, theoretically right theoretically think about what you're doing when you're filtering markets using dsp you're throwing away a lot of information about the detailed turning points and detailed behavior in between those the, the those cycles and waves that you're looking for uh, but but what we get to do with right, the pattern recognition is sort of pick all of that up off the floor and say, hey, this isn't rubbish. This actually has explanatory power, this information. Yeah. So the two models complement themselves. But mm. what we're not doing when we when we're employing this 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 structure that we have is we're not trying to churn more juice out of the same information. We're actually taking the information that's discarded by the one model and sort of bringing it back in, saying, no, there's actually explanatory power here that adds value in its own right. And it's not, we're not trying to bring more juice out of the same, out of the same stuff, if you know what I mean. 
it's very complex stuff you're talking about here. You know, I'm, I'm imagining this world of sort of constructive and destructive interference, all of this sort of stuff happening, noise, useful stuff, all of that. But does it translate into um, useful objectives for you that definitely add alpha to your to uh, what you're bringing to the table? Paul, go ahead. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, they, they, they add alpha, but also the most important thing for us is they add consistency. Yeah, so if you have, a, have models which you know operate in a variety of different market conditions and they they are able to handle different different like market environments um then that consistency is one of the most useful things you can add to add to a model um uh and then and then there's also the other thing is 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 it's it allows you to 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 re to learn where you actually um You've, you've had assumptions, yeah, and then you've been able to question those assumptions using a methodology. So, for example, like when I, when I, with AHL, they had this, 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 this idea of using, um, like multiple moving averages, um, uh, at, at different parameters. And, um, you know, we use our DSP filters instead, but you can analyze moving averages using DSP technology. Uh, and actually what you realize they were doing is actually there was so much overlap between those multiple moving averages. They were largely doing the same thing. They were, they thought they were doing, uh, they had four separate models, yeah, or six separate models running on the one market, but really they had the one model running on it, but they didn't know they did. Yeah. Because they didn't realize it was acting hmm. as one. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, um, because without the technology, they they weren't able to properly analyze it. Yeah. They were only able to look yeah. at back tests and see where they made a difference. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's, it's adding that knowledge. Yeah. And understanding. Yeah. Which helps you to decide whether, what, you know, what, whether the model is fit for a current environment or not. Yeah. Gentlemen, can I bring it a little bit out of the ethereal into some practical uh, stuff, especially for our listeners, um, just in terms of time frame. So, if you if you've got a, a methodology that can access that can analyze this much data in that way, um, I think you've hinted at it that in in the end, it actually lends you to tr toward trading slightly longer time frames. Do you use daily data, or is there uh, an opportunity here to use tick data, minute data, and do things with a lot more data. Are you interested in that uh, short-term trading? Is it primarily long time, long term, for long term, and do you use just standard end-of-day priced uh, data, so to speak? Yeah, we're we're medium to long term. You know, we yeah, I mean, yeah, we have all of that data, right? The short-term data or whatever, but we we would look at that more from a more detailed perspective if we were doing research into execution and things mm. like that from, you know, the, 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 we, we want, you know, we, we're looking to take it, you know, gain statistical advantage or positive skew from, uh, you know, <laughs> Not sure. a, a, lot, a, medium, a medium to longer term time frame perspective, right? Because they, they, then you have capacity, right? You have capacity to manage actual money where, where you get too high frequency and this and that. Yeah, they, they, you can get systems that perform really well. Right. But, um, but, but yeah, but they, you know, tend not to have um, too much capacity, capacity and stuff. Mm. But, you know, I think, I think if you, if we can kind of like explain to you how, you know, Paul, Paul, I mean, I can do it, but like, I'll, I, you know, but I'll let Paul do it, uh, um, you know, as to how we actually deploy the two techniques together yes, and how they how they how they work together might kind of uh, give you a better understanding and, and not be so ethereal in terms mm -hmm. of please yeah so um so for every market um we've uh, analyzed market behavior yeah we're using dsp technology yeah and so everybody every, most we found like there are groups of markets that have um if you like their own their own kind of signature yeah and so they tend to have um, uh, DSP filters applied to them, which have a lot of similarity. So, for example, you know, our bond, bond markets are, you know, don't have the same kind of frequency signature as, say, equity markets or FX markets and commodity markets. So we tend to have things which are grouped into different kind of buckets uh, 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 um, 
to, which have like a certain common frequency signature yeah and they'll they'll be implementing those those um those dsp uh filters uh then layered on top of that, yeah, we have the the pattern recognition, and the pattern recognition is looking for more behavioural um, aspects of the market rather than frequency. It's looking for you know, sequences of turning points within the market, basically sequences of highs and lows, and those sequences of highs and lows inscribe kind of certain behaviour or expected behaviour from that. So from the patterns, we can get a um, a probability of of a directional change uh, following a sequence of uh, highs and lows, which uh, which are inscribed by the patterns we're looking for. The patterns are uh, very variable. They, they they could occur over over days or weeks or months. Yeah. So they're, they're, there's no there's no periodicity associated with the patterns. The patterns are very much about the behaviour of, of of the path that the market moves through at any point in time. Um, but what we find is, is say for example, at, the, at, the, at a potential market top, yeah, we might find that the uh, our DSP systems are at maximum strength. Uh, the signal's really strong, and that might take a while. If that market then turned around, we might find that that might take quite a while for the uh, for the f new frequencies to be detected, yeah, in which case, you know, does, does, that represents a lag associated with the response to that model. But at this point, our, this is where our patterns kick in, because the patterns, yeah, often at the top of markets or the bottom markets, you get this 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 period of volatility. And that volatility to the patterns is actually something that's interesting. It's the sequences of highs and lows, and that may. Um, um, inscribe a pattern at that point yeah so if say for example we've got a uh, our our main mark our dsp models are long yeah and then our patterns may detect a, a reversal at this point a bear pattern yeah at this point we'd go flat of that market because we kind of got maximum uncertainty we've got like maximum disagreement with the models when we've got maximum disagreement yeah, yeah the safest thing to do is just be flat yeah. Um, so what we find ourselves with that methodology is one of the most difficult timings for like directional strategies is when the direction changes. Yeah. And when the direction changes, you don't really know exactly whether it's going to consolidate. Yeah. And and retrend, or it's going to consolidate and reverse, or just reverse. Yeah. So if you could be flat during those periods of uncertainty, yeah, you reduce your volatility overall. Uh, by by reducing the uns um, your yeah, basically reducing your positions at times of uncertainty. Gotcha, Paul. Listen, yes. just before we move on, um, just for our listeners, so we, we we haven't gone into the basics here yet. Um, so we we're talking. With, you're a trend follower. You'd consider yourself a trend follower um, in your approach. Is that um, how you classify yourselves? Yeah, yeah. Directional is what we tend to call it. So yeah, so. Trend, okay. trend following is one of those things that everybody's a trend follower but in a way but depends what your what your uh time frame is yeah so if you're high frequency yes. you're probably following trends yeah but in a very short term time frame so you're still a directional trader yep. yeah it's only if you're an yep. uh, uh if you're an arb trader yeah you're not a trend follower or if you're market neutral you're not a trend follower but in many yes. ways a lot of strategies are directional yeah so uh trend following is, is you're itself very unique strategy. from what i've Sort of understood in the market you know I'm, I'm thinking of people like bill dryce who understands you know fractal nature of markets you guys are heavily into this drp does this therefore mean that you are uh, you're uniquely positioned in the trend following cta space and how is your correlation to the rest of the the trend followers are, are you similar correlations well i mean i mean you know we, we we've i mean we're just going through the uh uh the sort of the, the model set up at the moment we've got a we've, we've got we've got a lot of more uh, uh sort of different differentiators to talk about kind of thing yep. but yep. the fact is right that our pattern recognition methodology is extremely unique to us i mean in you know in the quant game in quant hedge funds or whatever a lot of people like to coin the term you know pattern recog or whatever but what people mean by it in terms of what they're actually doing with it or, or what they're actually deploying 
can be very, very, very different, right? Uh, even though they still refer to it as pattern recognition. So our pattern recognition is based on the legacy of David Beach, who developed pattern recognition framework at Beach Capital and had, you know, a 20 plus percent a year average return mm. track record for 17 yeah. years straight, right? Mm. And he was known for for this uniqueness uh, that he had. And and so we, you know, he was discretionary and he he, he managed patterns in a discretionary basis, but we we worked for years and it took a long time to get it automated. But and David's own team actually failed to ever do that, even with David knowledge and stuff. So so we we were able to automate this uh, technique and deploy it, you know, in the context of what we were doing with DSP, as we've described. And it cuts off the lag of response of the DSP models. You know, if we get out early because of patterns, uh, and then suddenly the the market does reverse, and then our DSP eventually goes short. Well, then, you know, we're then back in agreement, and then we'll retake a short position. But we've cut off that that lag of response for, of okay. the DSP from from being long to to then getting short. Um, in terms of taking that hit. The transitional hit that you would take when a when a when a trend reverses, whatever. But the thing is, this pattern recognition method that we have, it's not in any book. There aren't any papers published about it or whatever. This was completely developed by David Beach from back in his days when he started in the eighties at Saber, and uh, carried on developing it at Beach Capital. Uh, and and so no one knows it. No one else knows it. No one else has this methodology. And they are proper chart patterns. Right, they are patterns on charts, but not ones that you would know. Right, they're not head and shoulders or ascending. Are they just discovered or, or through uh, the machine learning process? Yeah, essentially, yes. But there, there is a, but they're code, they're, they're codified, right? In that there's a very distinct set of rules, and 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 the thing about it is they're not static patterns. They're not like, hey, look at that head and shoulders in crude last week or whatever, right? Uh, that may or may not have broken. The, the the rule set is designed to evolve, uh, sorry, uh, follow the price evolution. So at every stage as the price moves, certain pattern possibilities start to emerge, but others fall away. So because of the rule set of the way that we're searching for these patterns, so it's adaptive uh, alg algorithmically. Yeah, it, 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 the the methodology itself is adaptive. It's not adaptive because we're re-optimizing through machine learning or, or whatever. It's algorithmically coded in, in, in uh, and the set, the rules themselves uh, uh, follow the price evolution. So because of all of that, this is very, very, no one else in the world has that. No one has this technology that we have. It's very, very proprietary. And therefore no one has this insight as to the two aspects of them working together in a complementary fashion. See, we knew this, right? We, we, we knew this before we even started. The, the whole reason we wanted to automate patterns is because back in the day, all these people who invested in other CTAs, right, were banging on David's door saying, please open up and let us in and give you more money. Why? Because they were invested with the normal quant type CTAs and they knew David was different. So we already knew from the get go back in the day, uh, before developing pattern recognition ourselves, we were always going to do a combinatorial fund with David, but then he ended up retiring and uh, from doing that kind of thing and doing it that way. Do you, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. we knew the two approaches were, were complementary uh, kind of thing. So, that, so you, that, you live in a okay. safe house with your intellectual property all protected, I assume, because you're the only ones who's doing it. <laughs> well, That's you know, right. someone can steal it if they want, but they wouldn't they, they wouldn't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. We should remind you that the conversations on this show are informal and for entertainment purposes only. Certainly any general advice you may hear is obviously not specific to your needs, goals or objectives. So, nothing discussed on the show should be considered as investment advice. If you want that, you'll need to actually do your own research and speak with your financial advisor. Remember, trading can be extremely risky and past performance is not necessarily indicative of future returns. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe or leave us a review. And if you have any questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Bye for now.